We've done some pretty cool bike builds over the last year, but today this one is special. Ever since I decided to start documenting some of these bike builds, it's been my little sister Spring that's been probably the most supportive. She's an amazing individual, loving mother, wife, and an artist. And shortly after we started publishing the first videos, she wanted to know when we'd be fixing the bike for her. Well, not to get overly sentimental, but after many years of teasing by her older brothers, I figured it was time we did something nice for her. So Spring, this is your surprise bike we're gonna fix up just for you. Even if you're not into fixing up older bikes, her reaction at the end is worth sticking around for. By the start of the 1960s, balloon tired bikes had been the rage for almost 20 years. Tanks, fenders, lights, chain guards, grips, Springer forks, anything that could make these bikes look more like a motorcycle were still the rage. And yet somewhere in the 1960s, that exaggerated style began to fade in exchange for lighter bicycles with more muted designs. There were still fenders and racks chain guards, and even lights. But now function and lightweight riding qualities began to take more of a precedent. And for the first time, we started seeing coaster brakes coming into full play. And that's where this little blue J.C. Higgins fell in. From the mid-1940s, clear through the 1970s, there was just a handful of manufacturers that made most of the department store bikes that you could find. Montgomery Ward, Sears Roebuck, Hawthorne, J.C. Higgins. These were all common names found in regular department stores and catalogs. And often, many of the frames were built by the same manufacturer and then simply rebranded by the department store chain. And while this bicycle wasn't ridden too hard, unfortunately time and corrosion got to the batteries. After much scraping and sanding, unfortunately I was not able to save the light. We'll be replacing this one eventually with an aftermarket. Something I've learned about working on older American bicycles is the need to have a decent set of American wrenches. Most of us that worked in bike shops are used to metric and Allen tools. But when it comes to old frames like this, you'd be surprised just how many different American sized fasteners there are. When I finally made it down to the hardware store to replace some of these old bolts, I ended up with nine different sizes. People often ask me how you identify the year and make and model of a bike. If you take a look underneath the bottom bracket, there's often a serial number posted. And on some of these American old bicycles, you'll also see it stamped on the lower rear dropout. Thanks to sites like Bicycle Stack Exchange, Rad Rod Bikes, and TheCave.com, it's getting easier to find catalogs of older bicycles. This will often tell you where it was manufactured and even the month and year it was manufactured. Fast forwarding a little bit, I dropped off this frame and parts a few weeks ago to have it sandblasted. Now, I thought long and hard about the process of having this powder coated, but I wanted to see the original frame as it was. Check on the brazing, make sure there was no cracks or things I couldn't see before. And luckily for us, this frame was in really good shape. There was virtually no dents or dings in the frame itself, and the brazing was all intact. It's kind of cool to go back and look at the character to see how these things were done. 
here you can see the dropouts were literally inserted into some tubing and then crushed shut using a type of press. Here a middle brace was used to hold the tanks and also add some stability between the upper tubes and the lower tubes. After a thorough inspection of the frame and the parts, the only thing we really needed to work on was the luggage rack on the back of the bike. Bondo time! Ooh, <coughs> some sticky stuff. It's strong. Ooh. Here's the hard part, 5%. I don't know how you can get 5% of it. This is the accelerant. Hardware, yeah. I don't say it often enough, but my dad is one talented guy. I don't think I've ever seen a week go by where dad isn't working on a car, a snow machine, ATV or something. And when I asked dad about doing Bondo work, he's like, yeah, let's give it a try. So of all the products I've used for primer, I'm especially fond of spray dot bikes. It goes on smooth and doesn't run very easily, and just puts on a really nice easing coat. Another product I love of theirs is the Frame Builder's Smoothing Putty. If you have a lot of fine scratches and even small dents and wrinkles in the frame, Smoothing Putty can be used to help cover up and hide some of that. It takes a little bit longer for it to dry and work but it's definitely worth the effort. And finally onto their paint. I am still trying to work out the kinks in my process. Sometimes I feel like I'm getting way too close, sometimes not close enough. And the amount of overspray you get can be incredible. Still, it doesn't run. You really, really have to spray it hard in one spot to get it to run. And so I suppose for a lot of us newbies, that's a good thing. Definitely though, for the price, at 15 bucks a bottle, this is worth giving a shot. Because the primer went on so smooth and had such a nice easy finish, it was easier to go with confidence in spraying these small parts. The nice thing about Spray Dot Bike is it does dry very quickly. So within 10 minutes, you're ready for the next coat. When it comes to fine sanding, they recommend to use simple parchment paper as an abrasive. I was surprised at how well it smoothed things out. So early on in this project, I wanted to do something a little special for this paint job. And I knew that my skills were not up to the task. So I reached out to a gentleman named Brooke Passy. He is an incredible artist who specializes in lettering and scroll work. I found his process absolutely fascinating. So I'll stop talking and let his artwork speak for itself.
So Brooke's been doing this kind of work for more than 40 years, and he doesn't have to advertise because everyone comes looking for his work. He really is a one-of-a-kind guy. So just wrapping up this paint job, we did two layers of clear coat to make sure that the scroll work was gonna be protected and to make sure that the yellow spray paint held up well. For years, I've wanted to get a benchtop polishing disc. It is so much faster than just using steel wool and for all this chromed out parts that were getting a little dull, this lightweight polish made quick work of it. This 1963 J.C. Higgins came with an original Bendix coaster brake. Almost all the parts were made of hardened steel. If you compare them to a modern day coaster brake, these would outlast them 10 to 1. Also unique to these is that the brake pawls are made of solid brass. So when you pedal backwards to brake, you had a softer metal on hardened steel and it had a much better feel for the brake. Years ago when I rode a coaster brake bike for a long time, I was constantly breaking the screw mechanism because it wasn't hardened and the brake poles would sometimes get stuck because they would overheat and fuse to the inside of the hub. Just a tip on working with older wheels that have not been tensioned in decades. If you add just a drop of tri-flow on the top of each of the threads of the nipple, this will help get things spinning again so that the spokes don't break under tension.
Hey! Ah, it's yellow! <laughs> yellow Dorito! <laughs> How's it going, sis? Oh my gosh, I love it! <laughs> oh my gosh, it's perfect! Look at that! Is it okay? <laughs> oh, look at that! That's amazing! Oh, I love it so much! Look at these! These are like old school looking! Do you enjoy it? I enjoy it! <laughs> That is so <laughs> awesome. That's beautiful. Does it have the light? Um, I've got a light on the front for you. I, okay. I haven't put it on there yet, though. Oh, this is so awesome. I got it all put together and Look I forgot. Look this. Because I have to bolt from the bottom. I'm like, dang, I don't have time. <laughs> it's okay. This is amazing. Okay. Oh, it's so pretty. And this won't be on the film here, but this is super good on here right now because I didn't have time to rivet it. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're to come back and do some more stuff. <laughs> Oh, it's so pretty! <laughs> oh my gosh! It's like the most beautiful yellow. You want to take it for a ride? Yes. Okay, I think it's the right height for you. But okay. Let's see. So what you just watched represents probably about 30 hours of tear down, sanding, painting, building up. And sometimes people ask, is it worth it? I mean, it's a lot of hours to make one video or put one bike together but the expression on my sister's face was priceless. And this is why I do what I do. I love to see people happy when a bike project comes together. Thanks so much for watching, and please look forward to some more videos coming out soon.